Good morning. Good morning. As we think about worship, we come on Sundays for corporate worship. And it's a time for us to be and to think as a worshiper, not as a consumer. To think about worship versus being a consumer. A consumer says, design what I want. A worshiper says, I want to follow God's design. A consumer is a taker. A worshiper is a giver. A consumer says, my standards. A worshiper, God's revelation. A consumer mindset, please me. A worship mindset, delight in God. As we think about worship, Revelation chapter 1, middle of verse 5 and 6 say, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. As we worship, our concern is to respond to God and who he is revealed in Christ. In the context of worship, a few announcements as we begin. You can put your offering in the offering box at the back of the sanctuary. Tuesday, we have an elders meeting. Next Sunday, weather permitting, corn roast. And again, that's next Sunday at 5 o'clock at Grace and Glory. And then on Tuesday evening, August 18th, there's a men and boys encouragement. Weather permitting, we'll have a campfire outside. But we'll have to wait and see what the weather does. And in terms of praise, and I don't ask, I just observe, and sometimes people comment to me, very thankful for those of you who are reaching out to one another, giving just in practical and meaningful ways in day-by-day living. I don't keep track of them, but occasionally I hear comments just thankful for the expression of love in this season of life. Also, there's a home discipleship sheet available in the vestibule. You can pick one up and know at your leisure. As we think about worship, we want to sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and it will be on PowerPoint.
through Daniel's prophecy, reading a chapter each week without any particular comment. And in light of the song and in light of Daniel 9, we're reminded again that God is sovereign. He's in control. Arden is going to be reading for us. Arden? Good morning. morning. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9. As I, as I read through this, uh, when Pastor did a study on Daniel, it kind of gets to the, for the Jewish nation, this was kind of like their revelation. And it says this pandemic has been going around. This, this chapter 9 really opens your eyes up a little bit more, too. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer, petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, O oh Lord, we find our kings, our princes, and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord, our God, is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord, our God, and kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away from refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us. Because we have sinned against you, you have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all the disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not sought favor from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does. Yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who made for yourself a name that endured to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong, O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts. Turn away your prayer and your wrath them from Jerusalem. Your city, your holy hill, our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act for your sake. 
O my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill, when I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have <clears throat> come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and six seven. Seventy-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreased. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up a domination that causes desolation. And to the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Thank you very much, Arden, for reading for us this morning. And again, we read. We give no comment on the passage that we're reading. Daniel had freedom in prayer. We have the same freedom in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, the Psalms frequently speak of the necessity of your children praising you. We praise you for what you and your names and character and works reveal. Your Jehovah, Shama, the independent, self-existing one, who is present. Your Jehovah Nissai, the independent, self-existing one, who is our rod, our staff, our protection. Your God Almighty, the one mighty and powerful to satisfy, nourish, and supply. In your character, we know that you're holy, merciful, compassionate, all-knowing, everywhere present, avenging, faithful, and eternal. Just a few of your works, creation, blessing Joseph while he was in Egypt, delivering three men from the fiery furnace, feeding Elijah by the ravens, answering Daniel's prayer as we read in Daniel 9 this morning, Christ coming as a human, but yet the God-man, your humbling Saul who became Paul, raising Christ from the dead. Lord, we live in perilous times. The world is so different from your <clears throat> so different from your call on us and our lives in Christ. In the midst of a worldwide pandemic, riots, election, economic turmoil, unrest, may we live for your glory by grasping the following paradox written by a Puritan years ago that the way down is the way up. That to be low is to be high. That to be brokenhearted is the healed heart. That the contrite spirit is a rejoicing spirit. That the repenting soul is the victorious soul. That to have nothing is to possess all. That to bear the cross is to wear the crown. That to give is to receive. That the valley is the place of vision. Lord, in the daytime, stars can be seen from the deepest well. And the deeper the wells, 
the brighter your stars shine. Let us find your light in our darkness, your life in our death, your joy in our sorrow, your grace in our sin, your riches in our poverty, your glory in our valley. Father, we recognize that we live, or as we live the above paradox, our lives will be sorry as men, women, teens, children, husbands, wives, dads, moms, employers, employees, students, shoppers, drivers, neighbors, and so on. Open doors for us to share and give us the grace to share words, to encourage people, to point people to Christ and his sufficiency. And as we do each week, Father, pray for the individuals listed in our prayer guide, Aaron and Brenda and Charity and Hannah Marvin, along with Alan and Peggy and Hayden, Colin and Kelsey Marvin. I pray for all of these individuals that they will grow in grasping your grace, your love, your power at work in us beyond what we can ask or comprehend. Pray for Aaron and Brenda and Alan and Peggy in their marriages. Aaron and Alan seeking to love and lead and nurture and care for their wives. And Brenda and Peggy following, complimenting so that their marriages can picture Christ in the church and be an example to their children. Pray for them as they parent. For Aaron and Brenda, parenting adult children, just how to encourage, how to point to you, how to live godly lives, when to speak, when to be silent. And Ellen and Peggy and training children who are still at home, knowing how to guide and direct and build character into their lives and challenge them to live in a godly way. And I pray for the parents as well as the children that you might fill them with a knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they might live a life worthy of you and please you in every way, being fruitful in every good work and growing in their knowledge of you, being strengthened with your power so that they can have great endurance and patience. And I pray, Father, in their respective jobs, they might just work Heart is unto you, seeing their job as their calling, your calling upon their life. Or if they're in school, to see the same being true. Encourage charity in a time of transition. Hannah, as she is working in, in school, they might ex- know you, experience you. And Hayden and Colin and Kelsey might be growing and honoring and respecting and obeying mom and dad. I think two of those in trial, Father, Al and Charlotte Ashton, Al being at John Hines now, Bill Beam having some physical problems, Traviola and the death of Art, Marty and Priscilla as Priscilla battles with cancer, Sam and Geneva, Sam battles with cancer, Lorraine and Riverside for rehab, then people going through some relational struggles and financial difficulties. My prayer would be, Father, that they may experience you, They would have a spirit of wisdom and understanding to know you, to know Christ. Enlighten the eyes of their heart that they might know the hope to which they have been called, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the power that is at work in them in this time of struggle, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. May they have wisdom to rest in you, and they might rejoice in their difficulty, allowing you to build perseverance and character into their lives. And in relation to financial issues, relational struggles, and physical, you might work in light of your will and your power, Father. We thank you, too, for Arlene Updike, who has served you in Africa and then Tacoma and now is in the latter years of her life. Thank you that she has a heart for you. She is seeking to finish well with a love for you, a passion to please you. Encourage her with the diminishing physical abilities. May she find a growing joy in your sufficiency and the completeness that she has in Christ. Use her to bless her family. And may she realize that a great ministry that she's had over the years can continue, and that is in prayer. You might bless and encourage her. For it's in Christ's name I pray.
Amen. Let's sing together and thinking about the time in which we live and our hymn of the month, Give to the Winds Your Fears. And again, as I mentioned last week, pay attention to the words. Some of you may have noticed Ray and Sherry and Bruckenmiller are visiting with us this morning, and probably most of us know they're going through a difficult transition in life at this point in time, but glad to have you here this morning and to worship with us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Ray and Sherry and their love for you know that they're going through a difficult transition in life. You're a God of encouragement. We would ask that you would encourage. You're a God of wisdom. Ask that you would give wisdom. You're our shepherd. You're at work in our lives. May they humbly wait upon you in this season of life, desiring that you would open doors for them in terms of ministry in terms of the desires of their heart. We thank you too, Father, for your word that we can interact with it this morning. And it's our desire to be hearers and doers of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, we've been looking at verses 7 through 21. We want to read verses 16, the middle of verse 16 through the end of the chapter, and then just take a few moments to review. 1 John chapter 4, beginning with the middle of verse 16. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among you, so that you will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love him, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. In verses 7 through 12, those born of God know God and love God's children. And as we found in 7 through 12, love is action, not mere words. And God lives in those who love one another, and they live in God. 
And again, that blows me away. God lives in us. We live in God. And then in verses 13 through 16, we know that we live in God and God lives in us because he has given us his spirit. Secondly, we accept John's testimony that Christ is the Savior of the world. Thirdly, we acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God. And fourth, we know and rely on God's love. Now this morning we want to focus on the middle of verse 16 through 18. What does love do? It gives confidence in the day of judgment. It drives out fear. It shows one is not a liar. Now, for sake of illustration, in light of what we're discussing this morning, here I have a bowl, and it has some iced tea mix in it. We're going to let the bowl represent our church. And in light of Scripture, we battle with fear, so the iced tea mix is going to represent fear. Here I have some ice Lemonade mix that is frozen, and this is going to represent love. Scripture says perfect love drives out fear. I'm trying not to go too fast lest I splash too much. But you get the idea that perfect love drives out fear. We need to understand love. In the context of the passage, in the context of God over all. And think about, as we discussed this morning, not only fear in the context of the individual, but in the context of a body of believers, our church or other local churches. And we find that there's an impact of love. It's verse 16, the middle of the verse says, God is love. Now, God being love is clearly stated In verses 9 and 10 of chapter 4, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sin. God can talk about love, but he showed love with Christ. Propitiation for our sin in chapter 3 and verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Sin is in the picture of God's love. Christ dealing with sin. And as we think about God being love, it's worked out in the book of 1 John. Look at chapter 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. In the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. Christ's sacrifice, purification. In verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in us. Christ, God's love, sin being dealt with. In chapter 2, 1 and 2, we find that sin is dealt with even in the present for those to whom John is writing, for believers today. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. John writes, don't want you to sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. In Christ, sin in the past dealt with. In Christ, sin in the present, we have an advocate. In chapter 3, verse 1, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we're children of God, and what we shall be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. As you think about God being love, in Christ he took care of sin in the past. Sin in the present, in Christ, 
We have a lawyer. In the future, we're going to be like Christ. I don't know about you. That kind of grace and love is overwhelming. In Christ, we're accepted due to Christ. Thus, we love others, as the text goes on to say. That is, we accept them where they are. That's amazing. And my simple question is, have you come to Christ? Are you experiencing the joy of God and his love? Now, I want you to notice something about God's love that God receives our expressions of love. We think of God giving. That's love. But God receives our expressions of love. Look at chapter 2 and verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. We obey. There's a judgment day coming, as we'll touch on in a few minutes. But he receives our love as we obey. In chapter 2, 15 through 17, we won't read the verses, but there he tells us not to love the world. Because if we love the world, the love of the Father isn't in us. So as we choose to resist the world's way of thinking and philosophy, and we live in obedience to God, he receives that expression of love. In chapter 3, 21 through 24, he says in verse 21, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and we receive from him anything we ask. Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. What's happening in the context? Our hearts don't condemn us because we love. We have confidence and we ask. God receives our prayers. And what does he say? He responds. He answers. God's love gives. But God's love receives. John goes on in chapter 4. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Lives in God and God in him. Remember the definition that we discussed last week. Lives means to dwell in, to have a permanence there. What does he say? Lives in God. John's hearers, believers today, living in God and God in him, but notice that there's a condition. Whoever lives in love. First John is full of ifs. There's conditions. In chapter 1 and verse 6, we find that John says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You claim something... Is there evidence? In verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. In verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. In verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. A lot of conditions. If you love God, you will obey. You will love your brothers. Whoever lives in love, lives in him. In chapter 2 and verse 6, chapter 2 and verse 24, chapter 4 and verse 12, chapter 4 and verse 13, chapter 4 and verse 15, all speak of the fact of God living in the believer and the believer living in him. And that's all contingent upon Christ. And what he has done. 
living in God and God living in the believer is amazing. A good response is just simple obedience, glory in the Lord. John goes on. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in him and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. Now, he talks about confidence in the day of judgment, but he begins verse 17 in this way. Seems to refer back to verse 16 where one is living in love, so God lives in him and him in God but also referring back to, I think, verses 13 through 16, where God has given his spirit. We accept an eyewitness account of John. We acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God. And we we know and rely on God's love. In this way, one who is walking in love, one who has the spirit at work in him, the one who is maturing in love. He says, love is made complete. The idea of completeness is to execute fully, to be in a condition of finality. You know, you complete something. So I remembered years ago, I graduation from college. Went, got my diploma, shook Dr. Robertson's hand. I was complete. Complete in the sense that college was done. So in the context, the one who is living in love is being made complete or mature or fully developed. Love is made complete among us so that there is confidence. Confidence means Freedom in speaking, assurance, frankness, no hiding or cowering, just an open book. John says, we have confidence. We have an openness, an assurance, a frankness. When? On the day of judgment. And the idea of judgment is when a distinction is made, you know, separation. There's a discrimination in the sense that Some go one way or treated one way and some treat another way. He's dealing with a judicial process and an administration of justice. Now again, I want to emphasize when love is made complete, we have confidence, assurance, freedom on the day of judgment. And that ties in with the context of God's love and loving one another in the sense that in Christ, sin has been dealt with. Past, present, and like Christ in the future. And then notice what the text says. We have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. In this world, we're like God. What is God like in this world? We already read chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, where God sent his Son into the world that we might live through him, and Christ became the propitiation. We looked at chapter 3 and verse 16. God laid down his li- or Christ laid down his life for us. We found in chapter 1 and verse 7, that those who walk in the light have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ purifies from sin. We found in verses 8 through 10, if we acknowledge our sin, no, there is forgiveness. We found in chapter 2, 1 and 2, that in Christ there's an advocate, there's a lawyer. God's love is present in a very obvious manner. When we love one another, when we're maturing in love, what is happening? We're like God. That results in confidence 
in judgment. I'd like to share an example of confidence in judgment. We have a student, we'll say is in college. They go to class every day like they're supposed to, and they want to prof- the professor to take the whole time. They don't want to get out of class early because they're paying big bucks to go to college, so they want to get all they can. And every day after class, and sometimes even other days, they will go over the notes that they have taken. They'll go over the textbook. And this happens to be an entire semester, 15-week course. And every day, go over and over the notes. Again, go over the text. That is the textbook. They do this day after day. They attentively listen in class. Occasionally, the student will go up to the professor afterwards and say, i got a couple questions. The student knows that judgment day is coming. The day of the exam is coming. And the night before the exam, the student doesn't even study because they have confidence. They have studied. They have listened. They've gone over notes. They've read the text repeatedly. So there's a confidence. There's a freedom. Let the professor throw whatever he wants at me. I'm confident I can deal with it because I am prepared. And that's the idea where John is coming from. Living a life of love. Being like God in the world. Judgment day is coming. There's not that scared moving back and saying, I don't know about this. But there's a confidence. I have loved. I've loved God. I've loved others. And I'm confident that God can freely examine me because I have loved. Now, that doesn't mean there's no sin and you've lived a perfect perfect life. But sin was dealt with in Christ also. He goes on. Confidence in the day of judgment because we're like him in this world. And then in verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Fear involves a terror, a trembling, being frightful. Remember being in a plane one time, and as you know, the engines start to increase their speed. And then you begin to move slowly, and then you get to the runway, and psh! I just saw a person near me. Fear grabbed the arms of the seat. And you could just see fear written over their face. There was a trembling. That's the kind of fear. Talking about, he says, perfect love drives out fear. How many people are fearing in the pandemic? Oh, look at the numbers. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to me physically and so on? John says, perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love is talking about mature love. The practice of love, responding to God's love, reaching out to others. Perfect love drives away fear, ongoing. Now I want you to understand something about love in the context of 1 John. It involves God's love for us, which we already discussed. Acceptance in Christ because of what Christ has done and are coming to him in repentance and faith. It also involves loving others. You can't separate loving God from loving others. As verses 19 through 21 make very clear. Giving in practical and meaningful ways to fellow believers, to a boss, to a co-worker, to fellow employee, just those in your world of influence. Just loving But there's a third thing involved in love that is accepting others giving to us. If I'm going to love someone, that person has to receive my love. We need others. We're not islands. We need others. But also involved in love is a willingness to share our needs, our struggles, our concerns, because other believers are not God. They can't figure us out totally. They can observe. 
I think many times as we think about love, we think about God loving us, we think about giving, yes. But also think about the fact that we receive from others. We let them give to us. We recognize we're dependent upon Christ and we show that dependency by being dependent upon other believers. The result is the driving out of fear. So as you think about love, driving out fear, we fear, we meditate on God's love, we give to others, but we share our struggles with others and let them give to us. And fear is driven out. Fear focuses on self, while love focuses on others. Fear focuses on, I can handle life, while love recognizes one needs help from others. Perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. You know, the idea of judgment, but perfect love drives out fear. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I want to give an example of perfect love driving out fear. Within the last couple months, I went through one morning a tremendous amount of fear. My mind was just going in a million directions. Now, what's going to happen? What's going to be the outcome? I was struggling. And being tempted by fear is life. Being tempted to fear is not wrong, it's part of life. But my action was the following. I mentally, as good as I could, just kind of sat back and said, you know, God loves me. My sin has been handled through Christ. It's been dealt with. I have a lawyer. Even as I battle today, Christ is my advocate. One day in the future, I'm going to be like Christ. And then I reached for that thing in my desk called the telephone. And I called a couple people. I said, I'm really, really struggling really struggling. Pray for me. I said, I can't talk long. I hung up. I called a couple people. What was I doing? I was saying, I'm dependent. I can't handle this. I need help. Help me. Give to me. Love me by praying for me. But then I did something else. I spent almost an hour a little, just a little bit later, giving to someone else. And I can honestly say the balance of the day, I live with deep confidence. And when the thought of fear would come, God loves me, and go over the things that I discussed. I already asked some people to pray for me, and I know they're praying for me, they're interceding for me. And, Lord, I've been loving. I've been giving to other people. So I can go on in confidence. I don't need to fear judgment. I don't need to walk in the fear. I think that is what John is talking about in these verses. Now, we talk about Scripture, but sometimes we need to flesh it out. What do these verses look like in life? Let me give you a couple of thoughts. Decreasing fear is not a -a once-in-a-lifetime As fear comes, we go to God. His love, we reach out to others. We let others reach out to us. It's a question. Don't want you to verbalize an answer. How complete are you in love? How complete is your family in love? How complete is our church in love? How complete are Believers in our area in love. Do we fear being judged by God? 
John says perfect love cast out fear. We have a fear of God, a reverential fear. That's different than the fear we're talking about here. Are we God-like in our love? Are we God-like in our love? Where we give to others, where we receive from others, where we meditate upon God's love. How much turmoil are we experiencing in the pandemic? Are we perfecting, or rather, are we protecting ourselves, or are we giving to others sacrificially? Do you ever think about Christ? Maybe I'm stretching it here. Coming to this earth, he's come to a pandemic. Totally different than where he grew up. Not grew up, but where he was for an eternity. He grew up here. He came to a messed up world. For what purpose? To die. If he would have backed off and said, no, I don't want to go into that environment. We want to have a Savior. He came. He lived. He died. He rose from the dead. He loved. And in the pandemic, we have to reach out and give in some way, shape, or form. And I'm not saying how. I'll let you figure that out, you know, as you walk in the Spirit. But listening to people, just, you know, giving in practical and meaningful ways. Use your phone. Give someone a call. Write a note. If you feel comfortable visiting someone, visit someone. But give. Perfect love casts out fear. But also receive from others. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and say, I'm scared. The numbers are going up. I need your prayer. I need your encouragement. Will you say, I would never do that? Why not? If you're not willing to do that, then are we living in love because we're depriving the other person of opportunity to minister to us. Love is giving, receiving. God gave, he receives. We give, we receive. Is turmoil, inner turmoil, evident in our lives? You know, turmoil that is just bubbling over. In terms of fear, in the day and age in which we live, I'm strongly encouraging you to limit the amount of time you listen to the news. Most of it, we don't need to know. It's not wrong to know what's going on, but too much of it just increases fear. Why expose yourself to that which is going to create greater fear? A suggestion or a thought for what it's worth, for every minute of news that you watch or listen to, invest two minutes in reaching out to others, both giving and receiving. Ten minutes of news, 20 minutes of reaching out to others and receiving from them. In addition, for every minute of news, two minutes in Scripture to keep your perspective in the world in which we live. And I'm not saying you have to do that. But we lose perspective pretty fast when we're bombarded with fear. We need to come back to God's love. We need to reach out to others. We need to receive from others. Plan time on a weekly basis or monthly basis or daily basis, I don't care, to love others in practical and meaningful ways. Physically, mentally, socially, spiritually, relationally, just caring for others. Fear is part of life. But what does perfect love do? God's love for us, our loving others, our receiving from others, it drives out. Fear is not a once and an all victory, once for all victory. It's day by day as we walk with God. I want to close with a true account of someone who has battled and continues to battle with deep fear, deep, intense struggle. 
but yet living with confidence and loving, experiencing decreasing fear, and sharing with others. I won't give a name, but the individual would tend to be withdrawn. Doesn't like crowds. Doesn't necessarily want to be around a lot lot of people. Doesn't want to be up front. Would sooner just be behind the scenes. They really don't like to do much at all in public. The individual fears conflict. Just wants to run from it. The individual has a fear of not pleasing others, thinking they must please others. If they don't please others, they might be rejected. A fear of that rejection. A fear of others politically. Well, they're not of my political party, so I've got to avoid them. You know, I'm afraid of them. Easily intimidated by others. A fear when marriage came that I will not measure up in marriage and the way I treat my mate. A fear of not having answers. I might be asking a question. How am I going to respond? I don't know how to answer. A fear of not doing what others might desire. And thus, rejection. The individual today Still battles with fear. But the fear is being driven out and getting a better and better handle. The individual is living with confidence, even though seems to be shaking in their shoes at times. Because the individual is experiencing God's love. My sin has been dealt with past in Christ. In the present, I have a lawyer. In the future, I'm going to be like Christ. I have a life of giving to others. Even when I don't feel like it, I reached out to others. I'm willing to receive from others. I accept the love that others express to me. And I share my needs and my struggles much more freely than I used to. An example of 1 John chapter 4 16b through verse 18. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your love, grateful for your word, grateful for your ministry to us. And as we think about the passage we've been discussing, we know that The world in which we live has one view of love. But your love is different. The love we're to express to one another is different. And Father, we confess that we battle with fear. We struggle with confidence on the day of judgment. We have inner turmoil many times, and that ties in with punishment. But we know that you have patiently and worked in our lives. You've drawn us to yourself through Christ. Your spirit is present within us. Through Christ, we live in you and you in us. In our struggle, in our battles, Father, bring us back again and again to your love for us in Christ, to our need, for our need to give to others and our need to receive from others. Mature us in love, Father, for your glory, that you may be exalted, that you may be magnified. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.